As Pastor Renee has said, we do welcome you this morning. Those of you who are regular, uh, regular part, a regular part of the Lighthouse family, we're so glad that you're here. If you're here um, really for, for Rose and Steve today, we're glad you're here also. And I know Steve has tried to speak with, with each one of you personally, but on behalf of Steve, and as he says, and Rose from heaven, um, they're really glad you're here. Um, the, I want to talk today about Meet Jesus again. And uh, I was praying about it this week, and I had been in quite a lot of communication with Steve. And this is something, just to, by way of introduction, this is something that Steve asked for. And I know it's something that was a discussion at one point with Steve and Rose. This is something they've talked about um, as as Rose and as Steve accompanied her through this, that such a, a difficult time in their lives, um, something that Rose and Steve wanted when it came to this point was that we would see Jesus and that we would hear about Jesus today. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, so most of us, if we have any church background at all, this is going to be so familiar to you. You may not even read, a, you may not even see a scripture that you've never seen before. You know, the Bible's a really big book, uh, but you're, we're going to we're going to cover familiar territory today. But um, as I prayed about what Steve and Rose had requested for this time, Lord, what do we talk about? What what do you want me to share? There's so much. Um, I feel like this is what the Lord led me to, and so this is what we're going to talk about today, meeting Jesus again. And I say again because some of us, depending on our backgrounds, depending on the choices we've made, uh, we, we haven't met Jesus before. Maybe we know a little bit about him, but we have made uh, other choices with our lives, um, and we've made other choices in our belief. And so for some of you, maybe you're meeting Jesus for the first time, but I suspect every one of us here this morning uh, has some idea about Jesus. If I were to, whether you attend church or not, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not, I guess as I look at you, every single person here could tell me something about Jesus. You could have some sort of description. You have some sort of idea. Um, and uh, as, so I was, I was, as I was preparing, I, just, I looked online at some things, and uh, I was thinking back to the ideas and the, the conceptions that we have of Jesus. So I'm gonna sh I want to show you some pictures, and it's going to date me. So uh, here's some pictures. Here are some Google images of Jesus. So for me, as I said, it would date me. This one to the left is the image, can you see it? Is, is that one familiar to anybody else? That may, okay, you know what? All of us who are North American, the three uh, US folk, folks, we all just nodded our heads and raised our hands because for me growing up in Sunday school, this was the picture, maybe it was posted on the wall. Maybe, I, I remember it was in my Bible, in the little ch uh, children's Bible that I had. And some of you may be familiar with some of these other pictures as well. And, and, and this is just a physical representation. Um, but some of you may have some idea of Jesus in that way as well. I, I find it interesting that uh, in these pictures, Jesus looks so very Western doesn't he? Um, when in fact we know very, very clearly from what the Bible says that Jesus was, as, in his, as a human, Jesus Christ was not Western at all. He was, he was Middle Eastern, much more Asian than Western, if you want to think about it in that way. Um, some of us have some ideas because of famous art, uh, maybe Rembrandt or Michelangelo or, or others, or maybe from, uh, from paintings or statues in museums. We have another idea of Jesus, or we've, look, we've looked at movies, religious movies about Jesus, and so I, I looked at some of those as well. And, uh, and this one especially caught my attention, and I'm not trying to make light of this, but I, I do think this speaks to what we're going to look at today as we meet Jesus again. He's so very handsome, isn't he? I, he really is. And I, I'm, I promise you, I'm not being sacrilegious. You know why that's not sacrilegious? Because that is not what Jesus looks like. The Bible says that Jesus Christ had nothing in his physical, per, uh, physical 
look. He had nothing in the physical appearance that would attract people in any way. Isn't that amazing? We always think of Jesus as being, he had to be kind of appealing in some way, right? He had to be nice looking. He had to be whatever. And, and this, this picture certainly, certainly uh, uh, reinforces that conception that some of us have. Uh, some of us may have an idea, and I chose some of those, you know, there's this aura about him or this glow about him um, looking extremely holy um, and looking sort of otherworldly and ethereal. And again, I promise you, I'm not being sacrilegious this morning, but that, that reflects our conception as well, right? We think of Jesus as, you know, he was God. And yet the Bible tells us, and we're going to look at it today, is that Jesus wasn't like that either. He was 100% human, as you and I are today, as you and I are today. And so what we look at up here, I think this represents or reflects our skewed ideas of who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. So we're going to look at some very familiar passages this morning about Jesus. <clears throat> Uh, most of you know, uh, uh, I've, I think I've shared this story before, um, for about 10 years I taught in China and I was with Betty Wyndham who was here in Lighthouse a long, quite, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, we were talking with our students and at that time we were teaching at Beijing University and our, our first year of students, they were the professors of the university. And I still remember one of, uh, she was very short, she had curly hair, it's very scholarly, very studious. She was a nuclear physicist studying and re doing research at Beijing University. And we were talking with her about Jesus. This would have been in the mid 80s. And Dr. Lee looked at us and this was her question. What is Jesus? She'd never heard his name. She knew nothing about him. She had no conception, either good or bad, negative or positive. She had no, no frame of reference at all. And I suspect none of us this morning could say that. And so we want to look at Jesus for a little while this morning. Um, and we're just going to look at a few, uh, at a few really familiar passages. Uh, I'm only picking a few, and I really prayed about it, because if you pick up your Bible, Really, the whole Bible is about Jesus from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. You said, Genesis? Yep. Jesus is in Genesis. He's in Exodus. He's in Leviticus. He's in Deuteronomy. Um, he may not look the same as he does in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Jesus is in, is in every part of the Bible, a picture of him, uh, a symbol of him, an, uh, an example of, of Jesus. So, but we're going to look mostly at the New Testament. And uh, most of you know, you know about John the Baptist, and you know that um, John the Baptist was the one that was the, who, who was sent. He came to prepare the way for Jesus, to announce Jesus is coming, Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God is coming. And I'm sure all of you have heard that expression before. And um, he talked about Jesus, the one who is coming. I'm not even worthy. Uh, I'm unworthy even to untie his sandals, but he's coming. And John had a lot of disciples because his message wasn't like any message people had heard. People wanted more. The, the people of that day, the Jews of that day, um, they had religion, but the religion was rules. Do this. Don't do that. And it was a heavy burden. There was no freedom and there was no life in, the, in it. And then John came along and he started talking about repent and prepare. And there's something else that's coming. And there's someone who's coming sent from God. And he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You heard Pastor Renee mention that this morning as he was praying. And so John the Baptist is standing there with his disciples. And Jesus walks by. And John points to him and he says, look the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world, and they're interested. The next day, as we read, this is in the Gospel of John, um, not John the Baptist, but young John, John the Beloved, one who would become his disciple, would become one of the followers of Jesus. John the Baptist again says, as Jesus is walking by, look, Jesus, and immediately two of the disciples left and began following Jesus. So I want to pick it up from there 
and um, let's learn something from what they do. So look at this passage with me. We're going to look mostly at John, as I said. So John is standing there. He sees Jesus, and he says, look, there's the Lamb of God. And when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. To me, that's kind of amazing, because here are these guys. They're young at this time. John, the one, we know that one of them, uh, we know that one of these two guys was John the Beloved, John the Disciple. John who would write this gospel many years later when he was an old, old man. And um, here they are, and they know some truth, but they don't know everything. But there's something there that draws their hearts. So I want to say something to you right now, this morning, before we even get further into the message this morning. If you hear something this morning that touches your heart, that piques your interest, that makes you think, what about that? May I say to you this morning, do what they did. And so th the disciples, they heard it's the Lamb of God, and they immediately followed Jesus. They didn't know he was the Son of God. They didn't know he was God himself as Son. And Jesus looked around, and he saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. I, I really like this because it's so simple and down to earth and practical. Hey, come on. If you were walking along and somebody followed, somebody started following you, what would you say? <laughs> what do you want? Or why are you following me? And you might pick up, you might pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so Jesus turns around. He says, what, what do you want? Because they're following him for a reason. They replied, teacher, where are you staying? Isn't that strange? He says, teacher, where are you staying? So I did a little bit of research and I found out that's a very, very polite Middle Eastern way of uh, expressing interest in the person and subtly and indirectly asking to be invited to the house. <laughs> That's what it meant. And so Jesus says, let's see what, what does Jesus, they replied, teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus says very simply, come and see. It was about 10 in the morning when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. I want you to notice something right off about Jesus. He doesn't hide anything. There's no hidden, a public face and a, and a private persona. Jesus is completely open with his life. They said, where, where are you staying? He, he says, come and see. Come spend time with me. That's what it meant because that, it was an invitation to be with him. And so what I want to say to you this morning is this. As the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, and if the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, you couldn't do better then learn from the example of these two guys who start following Jesus. We don't know who the other one is, but we know that one is John, a very young John. He might have been a teenager at this time still, or maybe in the early 20s. And so Jesus invited them in, and he says, come and see, and they came and saw. And what I want to say to you this morning is, this is what the Bible says about Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus Christ, this is in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the same what comes next? Yesterday, Yesterday and forever. That's right. Jesus is the same. He's no longer walking on the earth, but the character of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the nature of Jesus is still the same. He doesn't hide anything from you. You won't come up with a surprise that you don't like as you start to, as you start to know Jesus better and better. Jesus is an open book. Come and see. Come and see. Come be with me. And so they did. And so, as I said again at the beginning, I encourage you, as you hear things this morning, and as you see some things about Jesus, if there's an interest, take the invitation of Jesus for yourself this morning. He says to you, come and see. Come and see. And so, he goes with them. So, let's come and see this morning. Um, what's one of the things that Jesus says about himself that's the most famous? There are a lot of famous ones, but I want us to look at this one first. It's still in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Jesus was such a great teacher because he always used examples that they could understand. This was an agrarian, a rural culture. Um, if Jesus had been in Hong Kong, he wouldn't have said this. He would have said something else that you and I could understand better as Hong Kongers. Um, but he looked all around him. There were shepherds, there were sheep, all of these things. And so Jesus gave an example that would help people really understand, this is what I'm like. So this is part of the answer. When Jesus says, come and see, 
this is one of the things that we see about Jesus. He says, come and see, and he says, I'm the good shepherd. Now, those of us that have a church or religious background, we immediately think of another part of scripture when Jesus says he's the good shepherd, right? What other part of the Bible do you think of when Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd? He gives his life. Okay, that's going to be in the passage. We're going to see that. Go back to the Old Testament. What's the other, pa what's the other passage? It's a trick question. Psalm 23, right? Psalm 23. If you passed in the hall, I don't know if you looked at it. If you look in the hall, um, in addition to the picture there, look in the other one. We have Psalm 23, and we're going to talk about that this morning as well. And so when Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, he was talking to people who didn't know him, but he was talking to people who knew Psalm 23. Even at that time, that scripture was so famous. It was so famous. And we know it well, we know it well also. As I've told the people who are part of this church before, um, this was something that my mom gave me five cents to memorize when I was about five years old. And I memorized it. Um, maybe, well, you know, five cents went a long way in those days. <laughs> It was a long time ago. And so we see this beautiful picture because Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And Psalm 23 gives us a perfect picture of a good shepherd. And that's actually not the message I want to talk about, although I could as well, um, because we're going to look at some other things. But just very briefly, this gives us a good picture of what the sh a good shepherd is like. And um, David wrote, as a, who had been a shepherd, he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't that encouraging? This is what the good shepherd does. Jesus is a good shepherd. And then in the hard times of life, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. That one's a little bit hard to understand, isn't it? What do you mean you anoint my head with oil? To us, that's unusual. Um, for a shepherd, a shepherd always carried a flask of oil with him because the sheep would get caught in the bristles and in the brambles, and sometimes the sheep would butt heads together, uh, as goats often do, and there would be scratches and tears and bruises. And when there were scratches and tears and bruises, they were more prone to sickness. And the oil of the shepherd that, that he would take, he would rub it into the wounds um, of the sheep, and it would bring healing. And that's the picture here. Um, and some of you know that very well. You've heard that before. For some of you, that's a new, that's a new understanding of that part. Um, and so for those of, those of us this morning, as we think about this, you anoint my head with oil, Many of us this morning are sitting here with grief and with sorrow and with cuts and with wounds for a variety of reasons, but certainly because of Rose, right? And what the Good Shepherd does is this. He says, I anoint your head with oil. If you will let me, I will bring healing to you. I'll, br I'll bring healing to your heart. I'll bring comfort. That's what the Good Shepherd does. And we have this beautiful picture here, not just of a shepherd that takes care of his sheep in the day-to-day, -day, but as we look at the more eternal perspective, because brothers and sisters and everyone here, you and I are eternal creatures. We are not just here and now. We are, there's more beyond now. And David writes this and he understands that the good shepherd takes care of us here but also, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And it's the beautiful picture. He takes it way beyond, immediately, beyond um, the thought of a shepherd that takes care of sheep to the good shepherd, which, is, which describes Jesus perfectly. He takes us th through this life, and he takes us to be with him forever. And to me, this psalm at any memorial, any remembrance when someone has passed, someone who knows Jesus, somebody who knows the Good Shepherd, this is one of the most appropriate passages and the most comforting passages we could ever have, we could ever, we could ever take, because it speaks to us and it tells us the truth of who Jesus is when we're in relationship with Him. And so we look at this, um, and so 
Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and all of them would have understood immediately. They would have gotten the context, and they would have thought of Psalm 23. But Jesus actually says something different. So I want us to go back and look, and you heard Pastor Renee allude to it just a minute ago when I asked you the question. Okay. Is it frozen? Are we trying to load some other things? Pastor Renee, can you check? Hang on. <gasps> Thank you. Okay. Don't we wish tech could keep up with us? I don't mean tech people, I mean tech <laughs> in general. Look with me. Here's the passage. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And then at the end of the passage, he says again, I'm the good shepherd. Hey, what do you think he says in the middle? Let's find out. This is the context for us. Here we go. So he first of all, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And then he gives us an example. And he says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and he runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I want us to look at this as we think about the Good Shepherd, because usually we think of Psalm 23, and that's appropriate. But I want, what I want us to see is this. Jesus comes from a different perspective right here, and he gives an example. And may I put it in modern terms for you and for me this morning? Jesus says, I'm the Good Shepherd, and I am invested in you. Okay, hang on. I'm going to say that again, because some of us missed it. Okay, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And what he means is, I'm invested in you. I'm invested in your life. Why do I want to say that to us this morning as we look at this passage? Some of us this morning, we think about Jesus and we know about Jesus. We Okay, yeah, he's God, but he's far away. Jesus has too many things on his plate to, be, to care about my life. Uh, Jesus has too much going on in this world. There's the coronavirus in Wuhan and spreading, and in Hong Kong and other areas as well. I'm just me. Uh, Jesus isn't involved in my life. He's distant. He isn't interested. He's far away. Nothing could be further than the truth, brothers and sisters. Nothing could be further. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And what that means is, he's invested in your life. What that means is, he cares about your life. Why should he care about you? Why should he care about me? Don't you think there are a lot bigger things that Jesus should care about? Don't you think there are a lot bigger things that Jesus should take time for and pay attention to? Why does Jesus say, I lay down my life for you? Why does Jesus say in a modern translation, I'm invested in you? Why does he say it? Because he owns the sheep. Because the sheep are his. How do you own something? How, how does something become yours? This is just a, a, a common example. Here I have a watch. I really like this watch. This watch is my watch. How did I get it? I didn't steal it. I'm a good girl. I purchased it. I bought it. I paid a price for it. It wasn't a discounted price. I really wanted the watch. And I'm, I'm making a point. I, I bought it. I paid a price for it. It's mine. Do you know why I was willing to pay a price for it? I looked at it, and it had value to me. Now, look at this passage and think about Jesus and you, the good shepherd who is invested in your life. Do you know why he lays down his life for you? Because you're his. Do you know why he's invested in your life? Because you have value to him. Do you know why he is willing to do what no one else is willing to do? Because he went to the cross for you and for me. And he paid a price for you. He paid a price for me. That's why he's invested in you. 
It really is. That's why. Sometimes with our misconception of Jesus or God, we think, well, he doesn't really care about me. Again, nothing could be further than, than the truth. Why? Because he paid a price for you. And so he's invested in you. If you are struggling th this morning, I want you to know that Jesus cares that you're struggling. If you are in a depression this morning, do you know that Jesus cares you're in a depression this morning and he wants to help you? Do you know if you are fighting a battle and you think, I'm not going to win this battle, I'm not going to make it. You're trying to, some of you this morning, you may be sitting here, you may have had a relationship with Jesus at one time and then sort of let it get cold and stale and you may have walked away and you may think, I don't, I don't know if I can get back or not. I don't know if I can have a relationship with him or not. I think I've disappointed him too much. I, I think I've blown it too much. I, I, don't, I don't think he'd really want to have a relationship with me because I'm really a mess. Nothing could be further than the truth. He's the good shepherd and you're valuable to him because he gave his life for you. And because he gave his life for you, he's invested in you and you're valuable to him every single day. There won't be a time when he's less interested or more interested. He is invested in you because he's the good shepherd. He paid a price for you. What's the price that he paid? Let's go ahead and click, click okay? The verse that you know so well. Don't you? We all know this one, right? I'll bet most of us could quote it. John 3, 16, and then I added the other verse. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. And then this morning I added verse 17, just because it's so good. We need to hear it. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Isn't that great? See, some of you are thinking because you really messed up your life, Jesus is judging you. You're so bad. You're so, you're such a mess. There's no hope for you. You've asked Jesus to help you so many times and you did it again. And, Jesus, and you think Jesus is judging you. Jesus didn't come to judge you. He came to save you. Why? Because you're valuable to him. And he's given a price for you. And the next verse in 1 Peter 5 says, Peter writes about it. He says, you know that God paid a ransom to save you. Because we weren't just wandering around free on our own. You know that, right? We weren't just wandering around free on our own. We were in, we were, we were in the grip. We were... We, we're slaves. We're not free on our own. He redeemed you not with perishable things like mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Why would Jesus have to pay such a high price for you and for me? Why wouldn't gold or silver, why wouldn't the most beautiful diamonds in the world be enough to pay the price for you and for me? Because gold and silver and diamonds are perishable things. They're perishable things. They will, you say, well, no, gold lasts forever. These things are perishable. They're earthly. They're temporal. Guess what? Although you are here and you have a body and you walk on this earth this morning, you're more than that. You are not just for this world. You are not just finite. You are not just temporary. You are not just poof, when it's when when you reach the end of, of, of time, poof, you're gone. That's you're you're done with. No. You're eternal. Part of you it, you're you are made. The Bible says He, God, set eternity in our hearts. He set eternity in our hearts. Isn't that this that's one of the reasons we're so valuable to God. We're, we're not something of this world like gold or silver. You're an eternal being. And for an eternal being, God has to pay an eternal price. For an eternal being, Jesus had to give something that could buy back that eternal being. And he gave himself. He gave himself. And that's why he can say, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. So he's the good shepherd. Oh, I could talk about that a lot more, but I only want to talk about a few other things as well. That's pretty good, isn't it? He, he paid a price for you. He paid a price for you. Right now, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be um, emotional 
or to stir feelings. But what I would say to you right now is, if Rose could speak, she wouldn't, <laughs> she's in heaven, but Rose would say to you this morning, I am so glad that Jesus paid the price for me. And because he paid the price for me, I am with him eternally. I have been bought with a price. I'm eternal, and I will have eternal life. That's what Rose would say to you this morning. Um, and so Steve is speaking for her, and I'm speaking for her as well. He's paid an eternal price. But Jesus said something else about himself. Let's go to the next slide. Jesus then said, I'm the bread of life. This is, this is a little bit earlier. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. If Jesus were living in Hong Kong, he would not say, and if he, if he were Chinese or Filipino or whatever, he would not say, I am the bread of life. What would he say? Rice. I'm the rice of life. <laughs> now, again, before any of you think, Pastor, you're being a little sacrilegious here. I'm not. I'm not. Why did Jesus say bread? Because bread was their staple diet. Every morning, the, the sorry, those were the days the mother would get up. <laughs> the, the woman would get up and she would bake bread uh, on, on a stone or in a little oven. She would bake bread for the day. And every single meal that day, they would eat bread. It was the staple. It was the primary diet. It was what they had that sustained life. And so when Jesus said that, they all understood. It's like, oh, okay. Jesus was saying something about himself. He says, I'm the bread of life. In other words... I am what you need for life, to, to live. That, that's what he meant. And they all, they all understood that. And then he made it a little more specific and he says, those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. And then let me show you the next passage. A short time after that, he stands up at a festival and he says, if you're thirsty, come to me. And I want to put these two examples together. He says, I'm the bread of life. And then he talks about living water. Come to me. What are things that we need for life? You've got to have sustenance. You've got to have water. And Jesus uses these two examples of elemental needs that we have. Why does Jesus say this to us? Why does Jesus say, I'm the bread of life? Why does Jesus say, come to me if you're thirsty um, and I'll give you living water and if you, I'll give you bread and you won't, be, you're, you're, you won't be hungry anymore, you won't be thirsty anymore. Why does Jesus say that? Well, let me ask you another question this morning, whether you are following Jesus right now or not. But especially if you're not following Jesus right now, if you're not in a relationship with him. You may be in a relationship with a church, but you've got to be in a relationship with Jesus. That, that's what makes the difference. So let me ask you a question this morning. How many of us, at times in our lives, or even now, have felt deep within our being a deep need, an urge, a longing, a desire, something more, something more, something else, something better, something satisfying, something that lasts longer than this thrill or this day or this drink or this pill or this relationship or this purchase or this conquest or this promotion at work or this A plus in school. All of us have felt that, haven't we? Every single one of us. Every single one of us have felt that desire. Don't, don't worry. Keep, let's keep our focus. There's, don't worry about it. All of us have felt that desire. And this morning, if you are in a fresh, new relationship with Jesus, you understand what Jesus said here. Because you have come and you've eaten the bread of life. And he satisfied you. You have drunk living water and your thirst has been quenched. But some of us, even who are Christians this morning, have gotten away from this, and we've tried to self-medicate. We've tried to self-satisfy in certain areas. And those of us, I just want to tell you right now, without offending anyone, I can tell you from experience, if you haven't, if you haven't yet begun a relationship with Jesus, I guarantee you and I promise you, all the money in the world will not satisfy the deep needs.
the things that you feel in your heart, the things that you may not tell anybody. I've used this example before. Um, I went to graduate school many, many years ago. So again, this ages me, this dates me. Um, and in the US uh, at the University of North Carolina, if you are a basketball fan in any way. Um, and when I was there, uh, the team that year, on the team that year was the GOAT, the greatest of all time or whatever, Michael Jordan was there. So for those of you that are, he's retired now. And um, after he went pro, he and others, people interviewed Michael Jordan, pe people interviewed Tiger Woods, uh, people interviewed others. And they asked them what they asked them about this push, this drive to win, to be the best. What what was going on inside? Do you know what all of these top players said? I think the same thing was true in tennis as well. Do you know what every one of them said, as they as they talked about how long the satisfaction lasted of winning the game? It lasted until the next game. That was it. That was it. The satisfaction of being the best. The satisfaction of beating the the other team. It was just that long. And the very next day, it was on to the next thing. Brothers and sisters, and everyone else, for all of us here this morning, I, I want to say to you that until you come to Jesus, until you meet Jesus again, and receive bread and water from Him, the staple, the es essentials, the elementals, you will continue to be hungry. You will continue to be thirsty. And you may say right now, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I'm doing okay. I understand that. There's temporary satisfaction in many things, but eternal satisfaction and long-term satisfaction are only found in the eternal one, who is Jesus. You're an eternal being. Silver and gold won't satisfy you. Jesus will. And so we look this morning, Jesus said, and I think we're going to We'll probably stop with this. I had, I had much more, but that's okay. Jesus said um, more about himself when he says, okay, come and see. We, we're going to look at Matthew. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. How many of you are weary this morning? You're carrying a heavy burden. When we meet Jesus or we meet him again, we find out, that Jesus gives rest to us and he bears our burdens. Some of you have such heavy burdens, it may be because of grief or sorrow. Some of you have heavy burdens because of regret. All of us have regrets, don't we? You think of the choices you've made in your life and some things you just can't let go of, can you? You think, oh, why did I do that? Or you may think of broken relationships and all of us have broken relationships, all of us. And we carry these heavy things. And Jesus said to people who were very heavily burdened, He said, Come to me, all of you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now we think of Psalm 23 again, don't we? And we're coming to a close in the next few minutes. Um, as, as Jesus, as the Good Shepherd said, uh, we rest in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I, I'm, I'm at rest in green pastures. And this is the picture again. And then next. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is, life, is light. So I want to end with this because it seems like a contradiction. Jesus says, come to me. You're weary and you're he carrying heavy burdens. I'll take the burdens and I'll give you rest. And then he says, uh, let me give you a yoke. I don't want a yoke. Take my burden. Don't give me a yoke. Here's the picture for us this morning. Jesus says, take my yoke upon, upon you. Take my yoke and learn of me. And do you know what that picture is? Once again, Jesus used an example that everybody could understand because it was an agricultural society. It was an agricultural community. And they had to have oxen to plow the fields. And so they would take a yoke and they would put two animals together, two, an, two, uh, an ox and an ox together, 
and they would plow the fields together. And the yoke would be the heavy wooden thing that went over both shoulders, and the two, the oxen together would pull the plow, and they would, and that's how they would labor. That's how they would do the work. Two oxen together. And so Jesus says, here, I've got a yoke for you. Take my yoke. And then he says what? Let me teach you. Do you know why he says, let me teach you? Because when there was a young ox that didn't know how to plow, and he'd never been in a yoke before, he didn't know what to do. It was hard to do. It, what, how do you do it? How do you pull? I'm speaking for an ox. We don't know what goes on in their heads. But you know what I mean. Do you know what they would do? And a lot of you have heard this before. They would take an older, more mature, and strong ox who knew what to do. They would take an ox that could carry the burden. And part of the yoke went over the strong, mature ox. And then the rest of the yoke went over that, that young ox that didn't know what to do, that didn't know how to carry the burden. And when Jesus says, let me teach you. That's the picture. Jesus says, get in the yoke with me. I'll teach you. And you know what that means? What that means is Jesus is the strong, mature, big ox. He's going to carry the burden. He's going to carry the heavy load. You think he's going to put a heavy load on you and me? You think we're going to have to do all the pulling, all the pushing, all the plowing? That's what we think, isn't it? That's what we so often think. I've got to get this done. I've got to do this. And we wear ourselves out and we're burdened down with these things that we were never meant to handle. And Jesus says, come to me. Let's meet Jesus again and let him take your grief and your sorrow. You say, but he doesn't understand. Yes, he does. He went through. He was a man. He went through what you and I have gone through. I don't have all the answers this morning. I don't. We have questions that we don't have answers for. But we have Jesus also. And Jesus says, I understand. I understand. Get in the yoke with me, and I will carry your burden. And so we meet Jesus again, and it's time to stop for this part of the service. There's so much more, and we learn more about him. But you know how you learn about him? You learn about him by being with him. What did Jesus say to those two disciples that said, Hey, uh -huh. where do you live? Where do you stay? Jesus said, come and see. And it meant, come be with me. So I'm going to pray for you right now. And I'm going to ask you to pray as well, or just to listen as I pray for you. And you've heard some things this morning. For some of you, it's old ground. For some of you, it reminds you of things that at one time have been part of your life or part of your relationship with Jesus. And for some of you this morning, it is brand new. This is new. You haven't done this before. But you say, I'd like to come and see. I'd like to meet Jesus again. So I'm going to pray for you this morning because Jesus wants you to meet him. And he wants to spend time with you. And he wants you to know he's your good shepherd, that he's the bread of life and living water, and that he will carry your burden, however heavy it is, and he understands. So let me pray for you right now. Jesus, we come to you again this morning. And Lord, each one of us, Jesus, I want to meet you again. I, I confess that sometimes I get really familiar in my relationship with you, and it gets, I take it for granted, and it gets old, and it gets stale. And I don't want to be that way. I, I don't want to have that relationship with you. And Lord, maybe there are some of us, a lot of us here this morning that would say the same thing. We want to meet you again, Jesus. We want to renew these things about you that we've heard. Lord, this morning for those who are here that at one time could have said yes to each one of these things and now cannot say yes, I pray for each one. And Lord, may they just say yes to you again. So this morning you can just say, yes, Jesus. I, I want to renew. I want to restore. It's just as simple as that. I want to walk with you again. And then, Lord, I pray for those this morning who have heard something that they're interested in, and they're kind of saying, where do you live, Jesus? Where are you staying? Lord, may they hear, Jesus, may they hear your voice this morning saying to them, come and see. And, Lord, may they come and see. Jesus, we thank you 
for the price that you've paid for us. Not with a perishable thing, but the most precious, wonderful thing in the world, your very life, your very life. And we're valuable to you. And so, Lord, this morning, we again, or for the first time, we say, yes, I accept the price you paid for me. I accept the gift that you give me with living water and with eternal bread to begin a relationship with you. I accept your sacrifice. You laid down your life for me and you care about me. I receive your life. And from this moment on, Jesus, I'm not perfect. Jesus, I don't know all the answers. I still have a lot of questions. But Jesus, at this moment, I want to say yes to you. And I want to begin a relationship with you. I want to get in the yoke with you. Take my heavy burdens and teach me as you carry the heavy load. And I learn from you and I lean on you. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Good Shepherd. We're so happy to meet you for the first time or again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.